Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is MLB Inside the Numbers on the Fan vs. Fan Radio Network. A very special shout out to all the listeners that are tuning in this morning across this country, especially down, down in the Atlanta area. Go Braves. All my friends out there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, that, uh, you know, those faithful three down there that, uh, that tune in every week, appreciate having you guys on board. Uh, and all my friends up there in the Great White North, got to send a shout-out to Canada. Absolutely. Welcome to the program. I am the Insider Steve Silver, uh, and joining me, as he does pretty much every week, Houston's own, <laughs> Bo Reed. Good morning, Bo. What's going on, man? I'm not in Houston. <laughs> I know, I know. I, you know, I, I, pre- I preface that because, you know, for those that are tuning in for uh, first time tune ins, you know, Bo is, uh, you know, Bo is uh, uh, stationed in Austin, diehard Rangers fan, absolutely just dis- despises the city of Houston and everything it stands for. Doesn't really care too much for the Astros. Doesn't really care too much for the Texans. But you know what? I give it, I give it, I give it to him every week. Well, yeah, you're yeah, doing a good show today, Steve. I think, I think a couple people that we know and, uh, and we're quite good friends with, I think we're going to Hmm, yeah. We do have a fantastic show lined up for you guys. Former... New York Mets reliever, DJ Carrasco, joins the program, talking a little bit about what it's like to be a major league, active major league baseball player. We're going to talk a little bit about the differences of pitching in the American League versus the National League. Quite interesting. Maybe kind of dispel some myths about pitchers' parks and hitters' parks. I know a lot gets made, especially when it comes to bullpen pieces the difference of playing in both. We're also going to talk to him a little bit about, you know, what exactly is an AL reliever. He has been classified as, as an American League reliever. Uh, and what's kind of interesting about this, Bo, is I actually really thought that only just was attributed to the starting pitchers. But uh, I, I guess not so much. No, no not so much at all. It's a really fun conversation. I'm looking forward to that one. Absolutely. Hmm. Following DJ will be Dan Schlossberg from, from uh, the radio show Braves Banter. He is a credentialed media member of those Atlanta Braves, uh, lifelong Braves fan. He's going he's gonna to jump on, talk a little bit about the uh, National League East race. The Atlanta Braves currently sitting four and a half games out of first place right now. Lead the, uh, lead the wild card. But, uh, you, know, as, uh, you know, as this uh, stretch run gets into mid-August, as we get, get to the first of September, Bo, uh, something big is going to happen with those Washington Nationals. Steven Strasburg's 160-inning Im- limit is quickly approaching, and he's going to be shut down. Their GM came out and basically said, listen, we're, we're, we're holding firm to that. Whether or not you feel that is a big mistake, I do. I think they handled it completely wrong. It's going to happen, and that's going to play a huge factor in this National League East race. Well, it's going to be huge. The Braves are right there. The four and a half games out. You take Strasburg out of that rotation. You've got no one to replace him. Really, no one can get it to that level anyway to replace him. You know, it's going to be interesting working out badly for the Nationals. They can't just sit on this four and a half games. Okay, let's take our eight out because we don't want to overuse him. You know, and you're right. This they should have limited this guy's thing throughout the season. You know, you, you get too much in, you're in contention, you're one of the better teams in baseball, you know you're going to be good enough. Make your adjustments then. Have him skip a starter. Have him skip three or four starters. Okay? Save him for that September and October. Because, yeah, you can make the playoffs. And I think they will with it without Crawford. I think it's a playoff team. If you go on that postseason series, especially the short one without Crawford, you burn him out. To get, what's the point? Could be a first round anyway. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I agree. And the, and the interesting thing about this is, you knew that you know the Washington Nationals knew coming into the season they were going to protect him. They knew it. 
yeah. which is fine. It, it, it's it's a hundred percent fair. You have to do what's right for your uh, for your organization. And if he is your ace for the next ten years, which by all accounts he is, then you have to do right. I get that argument. But then again, the Washington Nationals are also independent chase. Right. You know their you know their division status is very real. And the thing about this is, you had to have the foreshadow after April, after May, that you were going to be in this thing the entire season. So you know what? They should have done. They should have done right at that point. They should have brought up John Landon from AAA, and I understand John Landon isn't exactly a sexy name, but at least you can add him to the rotation. Now you go from a five to a six, and you have the ability to you know to skip a start here and there if you so choose. You had you had the ability to push that 160 in, uh, inning limit into September. Yeah. Possibly into October. They should have done right. They should have taken out a page of what the Mariners did last year. With uh, 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 with um, New York Yankee uh, All Star last year. Why can't I? What what a shame! I can't uh, even remember. Uh, <sighs> anyway, Pineda? so uh, yeah, Michael Pineda. Thank you very much. Last year, the Mariners. You know, granted, of course, the Mariners were in a completely different situation last year. They weren't contenders, but they also they also played the role of knowing that he was probably going to be a very big part of their future. And the last thing they really wanted to do was stretch him out when he has never been stretched out that far in any season of his career. They did right by him. Skipped a start here and there. Kept him fresh in the second half. If they needed him in September, he was going to be available. They did right. The Washington Nationals didn't do that. And you know what? It's going, it's, going to affect, it's going to affect their September. And I've got to be honest with you, if they make the playoffs, you know what? I'm telling you right now, that rotation is not going to be the same. And I, I probably would have, I probably would, I'm going to go on record right now here, Bo, and say, say if the Washington Nationals do make the playoffs and Steven Strasburg is not there, it's going to be a first round exit. Well, you know, I've got to wonder. I really have to wonder, you know, the limited to what? Down for the stretch drive. Okay, they shut it down for the stretch drive, and then re basically put it back on for the playoffs. You know, what I'm saying? like you you rest his arm for the last part of August, all of September. You make the playoffs, and then all of a sudden you uh, you throw him back in in the playoffs. Have him in his and you start getting into the playoffs. Nationals all of a sudden have their rotation back, but I gotta wonder what that last time off. I think a lot of people ask the Nationals what exactly they're going to do, what, what exactly their plan is, because if you're shutting down Strasburg the entire way, in the world, down the stretch, in the playoffs, you're not giving yourself the best chance you have to win the World Series. And that's what all fans want their front office to do, is give your team the best chance to win the World Series. You take Strasburg out of that equation, you're not doing that. Mm-hmm. Phone lines are open, 714-202-9918. We're taking calls all show long. If you have one, go ahead and give us a call. You can also reach us out on Twitter, at InsiderSteve, at Let's Talk Rangers. Definitely love to hear from you. And we also have a comment from the, uh, uh, from the chat room. This one comes from Andrea Sox fan. I know her quite well. What about the most underrated pitcher in Major League Baseball, Jordan Zimmerman? What about Gio? What about Edwin? What about their bullpen when Clifford and Storm? No, you're right. But then again, depth isn't the – you know, depth – here's the, here's the interesting thing about this. Is, and I've said this all season long. The Washington Nationals probably have the deepest rotation in all of the National League, and it's true. But then again, Steven Strasburg is their best pitcher. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They, have the ability to, they have the ability to shorten their game. But then again – if you don't have your ace, I mean, we're talking about your ace. The guy, you know, the guy, the guy that you know for a fact you can give the ball to twice in a short game series if you have to. He is a shutdown pitcher. Felix Hernandez, Justin Verlander. Do those names ring a bell? Yeah, exactly. Yep, you gotta have one. You gotta have one. And I'm telling, I'm, I, I, as much as much as I like, as much as I like Geo, I do. I like Geo. But he's never been there before. Yeah, I, I understand that neither is Strasburg. But there's, you know, there's a big difference between Strasburg and Geo. Big difference. You're talking about a huge drop off. You take Strasburg out of the equation, you're dropping down to where Geo probably starts game one of the series. Zimmerman starts game two. And I agree with her that she's right. That is by far the 
far one of the most underrated pitchers in baseball. I agree with that. I get it. I'm not saying the Nationals are an automatic out. I'm not. Because if they could win a short period with what they're going in, they could do that. Okay? Mm-hmm. But take Strasburg out of it. You're not giving yourself the best chance. You're not putting your best foot forward in a National League playoff. Well, let's face it. See, this week is the National League playoff. Everyone's focused on the American League playoff and all the teams, how the teams are stacked up the American side. That National League side is just going to be just tough to go through. Take Strasburg out of that. You're taking a huge piece of the rotation out of it. And what, that, what, what signal is this to the players? They play off. They play their hearts out just to make the playoffs. If you look at our best picture, we don't know if you can get any from it. The Nationals, you know what? I get it. I get protecting your guy. I get it. I understand. But you need to adjust. They should, adjust. they should have adjusted way back in May, knowing that they were going to be in contention and make it to where Strasburg maybe takes some time off in the middle of the season because it would be for the stress part. That's what the national thing is say. I'm not saying that they're making a mistake by not by, by shutting him down. That's not the mistake. The mistake is not adjusting to where they, they have him for that stress drive in September and for the playoffs. Hmm. Well, Bo, we had, uh, you know, we had a laundry list of uh, headlines set yeah. up. But, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, nice little rant diatribe about Stephen Strasburg and the Washington Nationals kind of went a little bit over. No big deal. Yeah. So we're going to gonna have to shorten this one down a little bit. So, you know, out of the, uh, you know, out of the uh, four headlines that we had, which one, uh, you know, which one would you like to discuss this morning? Yeah, I think, you know, we talked a little bit last week about, the, uh, about some trades at the deadline. The one we talked about more than any other was Zach Greenkey. And we said okay. That- for this trade to have been a success for the Yankees, for this trade to have been worth it, they had to win the World Series. They had to win the World Series. Ricky had to be phenomenal. He was fantastic in his first start as an angel. He lost because he didn't get the run support. And then he's been bombed the past two starts. He coupled that with a horrendous road trip for the Angels. Now you start to see why that trade maybe, yeah, maybe was a little too risky. Because right now the Angels are sitting seven games behind seven to the West. Well, they're in the wild card. Actually, they're, they're behind the A's. They're going to have to find the A's. If, if, this, if this thing doesn't turn around, this thing doesn't get fixed, and they even think they're going to make the playoffs, they're going to look at that exact greasy trade as a huge mistake. Yeah. You know what? It, it's interesting, Bo, because I was wondering how this was going to play out. And I said it right at the time of the trade. I didn't know if this was a great fit for the Angels. You brought up a very interesting point when it happened, though, and you basically said, you know, as far as, you know, as as far as opportunity, and when you look at when you look at Greinke's talent, it probably could end up being probably the best deal made at the deadline, and I completely agreed with that. But then again, you know, I, I you know, I wondered what you know what how he was going to handle the transition from Milwaukee to the L, uh, to an LA market. Now, granted, you know, some people have chimed in and said, you know what, Anaheim isn't Los Angeles, but then again, let's be perfectly honest. The expectations are still there. The Angels are right in the right in the thick of a pennant chase. The expectations have been there all season long. He was brought in to be that third shutdown closer in that rotation. A bigger part, yeah. Yeah. His first start against Tampa Bay. You know, his first start against Tampa Bay. I wasn't I wasn't too surprised just considering Tampa Bay's offense has pretty much been anemic all season long. They didn't have uh, they, at that point in time. They still didn't have uh, uh, Evan Longoria back. And so, really, I wasn't too surprised that he came over and was able to do what he did in his first start. But the last two starts against Chicago, roughed up. Yeah. Against Oakland, who, by the way, had a fantastic statement series against the Angels, winning two out of three, lit him up. Interdivision games, that, uh, let's be perfectly honest, he was brought over to win those games. The A's are, you know, the A's came into that series knowing that they had to take two out of three uh, to really kind of, you know, kind of push that envelope and, uh, and really kind of take a hold of the second place, and they did that. Greeky didn't get his job done. And, again, it begs the question, you know, you know, where, you know not only just the, you know, the fit question part about it, just, you know, where, you know, it, you know, is his mindset, you know, equipped to handle this type of pressure situation? Because let's be perfectly honest. Doing it in Milwaukee is one thing. Doing it in LA is a, a completely different other thing. Well, this was an absolutely huge game of series for the A's. And I think that you know, we've been following the A's for the past few weeks. If you ask people in Texas, you ask people in Arlington, which team you're looking at, let's say Bo 
both, but they're really they're really starting to look more at the A's now. The Angels you know, they went into that series, they they lost the first game, win the second game, lose the third game, and uh, they lost that third game as they had a lot of their games on that road trip where the bullpen imploded. The Angels have got to do something about that bullpen. We've been saying that this whole season. They've got to do something about that bullpen. They haven't done it. They didn't do it at the trade deadline. They're not going to get a hugely reliable arm in August. Uh, so they're going to have to try to pass and figure this out because they're in trouble. And they're not they're not in trouble just for, for winning the AL West. They're in trouble for, for passing the A's for a wild card spot. And the way the Tigers are coming along, White Sox are right there. You know, earlier this year, we said, well, maybe two teams from the West because they were leading everybody. But now these Central teams are coming along. The East teams are coming along. They've got, they've got to pass the A's to get into the wild card spot. I think at this point, I think the wild card is going to come out of two different divisions to be the West and one of them. And they're one attempt to do that. I mean, you, you end this, you're in this dogfight with the A's. You go to Oakland, you, you're starting with starting great. You're expected to win two out of three, and your bullpen costs you two of those three games. That's not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it for the Angels. The Angels fans are upset. They're worried. They should be. Because you sit back all of a sudden, you go from last week, for example, they're in Texas. They take the first two in Texas. Up big in the third game, and all of a sudden the Rangers come back. They win game three, they finish game four, and the Rangers go from possibly being two games in first place in the West. They're now stepping back. When they're fighting the A's. They go to Oakland, they lose two out of three. They lose two out of three to an Oakland A's team that you, you have to respect at this point. I, I don't understand why people are still discounting the A's. They've got the best pitching in baseball. The suspense in the middle of that order is just unloading on people. That lineup is starting to I mean, they put up some serious runs against, against the Angel pitchers. They put up like, a huge amount of runs on the And the Angels for real, the Angels are there. And they're not going to go away. And the Angels, they have got the, the big, big three, big four in their starting rotation. But their offense is topping up. Their bullpen is horrendous. They're in trouble. That's bottom line. They're absolutely in trouble. That was, that was probably the series that um, that was probably the series that I watched more than anything this week. That I wanted to see how the A's mm-hmm. handle being in the race for the first like not, not for the first time, but not only being in the race, but being head to head against your prime competitor for a playoff spot. Your prime competitor, because absolutely, I mean, they're, both, they're both teams are five and a half years old. The A's are five and a half out. The A's are seven out. This was the first matchup in the A's in a prime competition for that wild card spot, and the A's passed. Colors, the Angels, you know, it, 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 was a, it was a 10 day road trip that they did not need. But it just it, it sucked all the life out of them. They were doing the building, they had the momentum, they went in after the first two games of Texas. Everyone was like, good boy, they're going to the Rangers are going to pass the Rangers before the week is out. And now all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're as far back as they've been in a couple of months. And they're even behind the A's by the end of the half. And, and if they can't beat the A's head to head like that, they're in trouble. Absolutely. Shifting gears, uh, shifting gears right now. We're going to bring our first guest, former New York Mets, DJ Carrasco joins the program. DJ, good morning. How you doing? Good morning. Doing well. Good. How's, uh, how's the summer treating you, my friend? Well, it's, it's been lovely, man. I've been vacationing, seeing the whole uh, northwest United States and visiting family and friends and uh, just enjoying the time off. Good deal. How was uh, how, how was your experience up here in the Northwest? Man, it, it's been lovely. We went to uh, Seattle. Uh, went around the whole town. There was a sea fair going on at that time. We yeah. did like a twenty-three mile bike ride um, through the mountain passes through some big like two mile uh, tunnel and and just seeing everything. Man, did a lot of hiking and seen a lot of waterfalls and stuff like that. Outdoorsy kind of stuff. Good, good deal. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed my uh, enjoyed my hometown. But uh, I did. You know, it, it's quite interesting, and I'm glad that uh, you know. I'm glad that you're on the program because uh, you know there's uh, you know there's been some talk, and you know you know mainly about uh, you know the difference differences between leagues, uh, you know the AL versus the NL, and you had the uh, you know you've had the uh, you know the ability to pitch in both. Uh, you know, my first question to you is, I mean, as a reliever. 
uh, you know, and, and some of the stuff that you throw, does, you know, does it change your, your approach, uh, you know, pitching, uh, you know, to a, you know, a power-laden league like the American League versus, uh, you know, versus the National League? Um, I wouldn't say really, very rarely do you ever change an approach. Um, it's just your style of pitching is definitely affected by, number one, for me, probably the park that I play in and, and the lineup that I'm facing when it comes to the American League and the National League. And what I mean by that is in the American League, it's such a power game where one through nine, or at least one out of nine, or, you know, eight out of nine guys are power hitters in their own rights. And whether the count is 0-0 or, or they're down the count with two strikes, they're still swinging to drive the ball. Now, in the National League, your, your type of player is a little different because the manager shuffles in so many guys. Defense has mm-hmm. to be a priority as well, and these guys are – you know, not just there to hit the ball a long ways. They're there to field and throw and run. So typically when they're coming in at these skilled positions, they're going to be a smaller type player that's, you know, geared more towards hitting the ball, doing the hit and mm-hmm. run kind of game, uh, button guys over. So when they get two strikes, they shorten up and put the ball in play a lot more than, than I think in the American League for my style of pitching anyways. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, I, I'll go – I'm, I want the ball to look like a strike, and at the last minute, I want you know some late movement to happen, so I get weak contact. And uh, you know sometimes it doesn't work out as well in uh, certain leagues. I found. Does that change? Does that change the uh, the way a pitcher would approach a batter? Uh, meaning, uh, you know, maybe more fastballs early in counts uh, versus off speed. Uh, you know, because you know you know when I look at the when I look at the leagues. Uh, you know, I noticed. Uh, you know, I noticed a lot of. Uh, you know, I, lot, I noticed a lot of. Uh, you know, cutters. Uh, cutters early in the counts. A lot of fastball counts. But then again, you know, a, as you just highlighted, you know, it may. You know, it, it may affect the way. A, you know, a, a reliever, a starter might. Uh, you know, might approach a hitter. Uh, you know, you know what. You know, what does. You know, what does that mean for you as a reliever? I mean, we're always taught, and, and I tried doing that younger in my career, like in the minor leagues when you're trying to trick guys and, and you're trying to pitch to their weakness. And what happens a lot of times is, number one, you don't have as much confidence and you don't have as much control. So now you're just getting behind the count and you start walking more guys and you start getting the hitter back into their count. So I like saying like probably 95% of the time you're pitching to your strengths, not necessarily their weakness. Sure. It's just if it matches up, then, you know, it's, it's better for you. But there's some guy that you've thrown the whole kitchen sink at and they're going to hit it anyway. So that's probably – not better mm-hmm. off, you know, pitching around them or trying to toy with them because, you know, a single might be better than a double or a walk, you know, so that's how mm-hmm. that goes. Now, you have been described as an American League reliever, and, I, and it kind of threw me by, you know, it, it threw me for a loop because, again, I've always thought that that was more attached to a starting pitcher more so than a reliever. I, I've always looked at it, I've always looked at bullpen pieces as, you know, interchangeable, especially nowadays. Uh, you know, as we've kind of, you know, as we moved, you know, uh, you know, away from the, you know, the Trevor Hoffmans of the world and some of the, uh, some of the closers from the nineties, uh, you know, it's just kind of the way the baseball has evolved. You know, what's the, uh, you know, what is the, uh, the term American league, uh, uh, an AL reliever? I, you know, I, I, me personally, I, again, I just, I, I don't understand the, uh, the, the terminology, uh, uh, imposed to a reliever. Well, I think, I think that statement is, is pretty much correct most of the time. Um, I think that I, w- I would like to think that I'm not that I'm a dying breed, but the type of position that I do out of the pen is is, a, is probably of a way more value in American League than it is to a National League. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is a long man that can throw multiple innings, and I'm talking you know three to four innings out of the bullpen, where that doesn't really ha- really happen very much in the National League. And I could throw you know multiple days in a row, where a lot of guys can do that. Um, but a lot of guys, you know, their effectiveness, they're hard-throwing guys, you know, hard sliders, hard fastballs, those back-to-back-to-back days in a row might, you know, wear on somebody more so than throwing the three innings of the day off and then another inning. That that workload doesn't happen as many innings, I don't think, in the in the National League as you can get in the American League. But, you know, the time, the opportunities to throw happens a lot more in the National League. So it's kind of, you know, it depends on the pitcher. If uh, if you have a guy that's, that's able to do that, then he'll he'll do well in both leagues. Uh, me, I like to throw consistent, work, you know, once out of every three days, two days. And sometimes in the National League, the starter goes five with a lead, then it's just one, 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 one. You know, in the American League, I could throw that fifth and sixth day just to get to the other guys because the bullpen won't, won't get burned out as quick. Mm-hmm. Well, fair enough. Fair enough. That's, uh, you know, that's uh, definitely interesting. Uh, it, it, it's uh 
it, it kind of makes you open your eyes a little bit, uh, a little bit more to how bullpens are used, especially in the American League versus the National League, where you know the uh, you know the double switch, uh, you know, in the National League, uh, you know, pinch hitters starters starters go shorter, uh, and especially in I think you hit it right on the head right there that uh, in the American League without uh, you with, you know without the advantage of the double switch, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Pitchers can uh, relievers can go you know two three innings uh, uh, at a clip. Uh, quick quickly though, uh, you know. What uh, you know, I was asked by my program manager, uh, you know, to ask you this question. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, you know, you, you've had the benefit of uh, pitching in the American League with Kansas City and Chicago, and the National League with the uh, with the New York Mets. Uh, you know, what uh, you know, what was your uh, what was your favorite uh, favorite park to pitch in, uh, and kind of given a kind of give a reason as to uh, you know what you know what made it so uh, so uh, so special for you. Oh, I I gotta say I, I had better numbers in Pittsburgh and, and Arizona than probably any of the American League, but mine was the White Sox in uh, Sailor Field. That was my favorite. Um, reason being is because it was a smaller field, um, and, you know, typically that's not the kind of answer you hear from a pitcher. But, again, when I'm throwing the ball down the middle of the plate and relying on late movement, I get a lot of big swing. So, I, if you know, if my mm -hmm. pitch is working at that time, I'm going to get a lot of weak hits. And I, I found that the bigger parks that I pitch in um, – those balls tend to fall in a lot more behind, you know, shortstop, second base, that 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 uh, no man's land between the infielders and the outfielders. Sure. And in uh, U.S. Cellular, the outfielders had to play in by default because the fences were shorter, and those would get caught a lot more times than they would. not um, Typically, these guys in the big leagues, if they catch a ball, it doesn't really matter where they play. I mean, there's some parts that will, you know, shut it down like Seattle and Detroit. Um, that you might get a catch, but for the most part, if I make a mistake and they're hitting it in the air, it's probably going to be out anyways. But that more times than not, that wasn't the case at that time. Now I find that uh, I find that relatively interesting because again, U.S. Cellular uh, Cellular Field has been labeled as a hitter's park, and especially in the summertime, right. when, you know, when the temp when the temperatures rise, routine five fly balls tend to go out. Uh, you know, especially right. the pull hitters uh, pull hitters down the, uh, in that left field porch. You know, same with uh, same with parks like Texas, maybe even Yankee Stadium, Stadium as well too. You know, is there? A, I, I guess as a pitcher, I mean, is do you feel more comfortable? Uh, you know, uh, pitching, uh, you know, pitching in a uh, I, I I hate to use the term bandbox. You know, versus uh, I guess you can say uh, you know quote unquote uh, uh, pitchers parks. Honestly, I did. I mean, it took a while to get that way. It'd be just you know because obviously you want it further back, so they have to hit it better, but. As I kept going and going, I mean, that, those couple of years in Chicago, it was, it was just more clear to me that those balls would fall in on the road and at home, you know, they, they were out. And I, I don't know, statistically that year, I think I was pretty tough to hit a home run off of that year. The last couple of years, that wasn't the case. But, <laughs> you know, then <laughs> it, worked, it worked more for me. And, I don't, you know, and I, I really believe that's why I had some of the, you know, some of the guys that crunched the numbers and they were telling me, you know, you're, you're hard hit or – more your soft hit balls off you were like you know top five in the league and that's and I was like wow you know I knew that it happened a lot but I didn't realize it was at that kind of a clip and it was a benefit for me to play in those smaller parts hmm. well that's uh that's uh you know that's quite surprising I mean generally speaking you know the, you know the most you know the, when, when you listen to interviews and, and most pitchers you know will tell you that it, you know it benefits playing in a you know uh, you know, with with a with a wider expanse in the outfields, you know, just in case you know a fly ball does get up there, they have uh, speedy outfielders that uh, right. you know, that have the ability to track it down. And you know, it's uh, it's interesting to hear that uh, you're a little bit more comfortable uh, in the in those uh, in those uh, shorter close uh, spaces. Most of them guys throw like 94 too, <laughs> you know, 96 that's, and that's that true. all this nasty stuff. I'm relying on you know deception where everything looks the same and it's and it's darting left or right or down kind of deal. So that's. It's a little bit different. That's why I see also with the, not necessarily the dying breed, but you know your starters aren't don't really have to be power arms or anything like that. But typically this day and age, you look at the bullpen and everybody is just a power arm. So you know That's not true. to have that and be able to throw starter like innings. Uh, not you know obviously not 200 plus innings, but you know towards the 100 inning mark out of the bullpen is, is a great asset I think to a team to to get to those power. I mean it allows you to carry another. Seventh, eighth inning type pitcher later on because you can cover up both of those kind of those mm -hmm. innings for them. I'm uh, I'm curious to get your uh, your take on this, DJ. Uh, you know, we we talked a little bit about the uh, talked a little bit about in the pre-interview, and I know that uh, right, you know right now you're uh, you're uh, squarely uh, solely in uh, vacation mode. But I'm curious though, you know, you know the the difference between 
Major League Baseball now and what it was 20 years ago, uh, and just the involve the the uh, the involvement of uh, prospects and the way franchises handle some of these young kids. Uh, the Washington Nationals are in this kind of situation where they are in first place right now. They are chasing down a division title. Uh, and, and for the fans of Washington, and especially that franchise that really hasn't been to the postseason since 1981, you know, how, how do you feel? How do you feel about the, you know, the the, the handling of a, of a guy like Steven Strasburg uh, in his 160 inning, uh, inning limit, uh, and not being not being available, uh, you know, uh, you know, for the stretch drive in the September run, uh, you know, as a player, I, I don't know if you've uh, you, you've been through something uh, something like that as being part of, part of the pitching staff. I mean, you know. How, how do you feel that? How do you feel about that if, if you were in that bullpen uh, and knowing that you probably wouldn't have your ace for the stretch drive? Uh, I wouldn't agree with it at all. I mean, this this whole game, let's face it, is a business, and businesses are yep. here to make money. And you make a lot more money when you're in the postseason and you get to the World Series. Um, I think they messed up last year by waiting so many days to bring him up. I think when they what was it? No, the year before when I was with the Pirates, he made his debut against us. And they were six games out of first place. And I want to say, I don't know, what you probably have the date on the online there, but I want to say he would at least have probably had close to 10 to 12 starts if he would have started the year with them. And I'm pretty sure he would have won six games. So they would have probably been at first place somewhere around that time of the year. Um, so they, to me, they lost out on a lot of money just trying to play the arbitration game. And this mm-hmm. year when you're in first place, I mean, it might not ever happen again for another 20 years. Who knows? You know, you got to go Absolutely. when you got to go. But, again, you know, we don't know. He's just coming off Tommy John. If he's telling a man I'm tender and, you know, I'm hurting a little bit, you, you know, we don't know that kind of stuff either. So if he is hurting a little bit and they want to limit his innings, then by all means you don't push a guy this far out. I mean, but, you know, back off the range now and maybe get right back on him at the, towards the end. So those are kind of That's questions. That, I mean, I haven't been watching it, so I don't know that kind of stuff. But, if he is healthy and he does feel good and, and all the signs are there when the trainers are checking his you know, his mobility and everything else like that, man, you gotta play him. That's your that's your horse, you gotta go with him. Well, I mean, you know, I understand the need as a franchise to protect your long term investment. I get that argument. And for the most part I can I I somewhat agree with it, but but again, you know, the nationals are the nationals are in a place where they haven't been before and you're absolutely right, this might right. not happen again. Uh, you know, and, right. and this is, you know, this is, the, you know, this is, this is unprecedented. And, and again, I, you know, I, I think the way the Nationals handled this, uh, you know, was a little foolish. I, I think if you knew that you were coming into the season with an innings limit on the kid, you, you, you skip a start. You, you know, you don't, uh, you know, you let him go five and a third instead of seven. Some of those type of things where you can, you can, you, you can push the date back into September, maybe right. even late September, get him a playoff appearance or something like that. You know, I, I think it's, you know, when, when you look at the standings and you see the Braves at their heels at four and a half games back. You know, and not having Steven Strasburg a part of that September run, I wouldn't be surprised to see the uh, the, the you know the Nationals end up uh, you know losing some ground. Yeah, I I agree totally. I mean, they could have pushed back his rehab assignment and got him back a little bit later too, and like you said, backed off the reins. But again, if if he's not feeling good, that's something that I don't know if they're you know want to let out or not. But you, again, you got to go with him if he's going to be healthy. Yep. Okay. Well, you know, DJ, I'm glad we're, we're talking about this because you know you, you've actually pitched in this division. What's the impact on the race here? I mean, you take Strasburg out of the equation; they still got Zimmerman, they still got Gio Gonzalez. Are the Nationals in trouble without Strasburg, or is this something? Or is this something that they can they can weather the storm with? You know, it's there's a lot more to it than just oh, okay, this guy's going to give us a win that day. I mean, that that guy, I don't know what his numbers are right now, but he might be averaging seven innings an outing or what it may be. And that's kind of like that's that's tenfold. You see it happen with the Rangers uh, the last uh-huh. couple of years, especially last year. I mean, that bullpen was just getting murdered, from, you know, September and then, or you know from the end of September into October. And if you can get a starter that you know gives an extra guy or two a rest every other day, every day kind of deal, every fifth day, whatever it may be, man. That you know, there's a lot of big situations. You watch the postseason, and it's. You know, every once in a while there's a blowout, but there's a lot of close games where, you know, that reliever's coming in with two outs and, you know, the second and third kind of deal. And you need that arm to be as good as you can. And nobody remembered that back, you know, a month ago, skipping, you know, skipping a start for this guy and then the replacement guy only threw three innings and now everybody worked an extra inning and a third that they didn't normally have to do. So all that gets exposed throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Quick question. And when you when you brought up uh, when you brought up uh, management uh, as far as uh, you know as far as uh, you know overworking of a bullpen, 
ha- have you uh, you know have you played for a uh, have you played for a manager or uh, you know just uh, you know just your observations around the league a guy who not only uh, you know not only uh, knew how to uh, manage his uh, starting rotation but also knew how to uh, manage his bullpen to a point where come August come September that the bullpen wasn't overworked or gassed. Yeah, but there's there's always I mean there's always both sides of the coin. I mean I've I've had some of the times where I'm coming in where the games are you know are close, holds, that kind of situation, but a lot of times it's been the other way around. And you can always second-guess something. Um, there's always, there's sometimes there's a lot of panic, especially when you're on that teeter-totter of the wild card spot or first place or whatever it may be. But mm-hmm. this is the big leagues, man. I mean, they don't pay you to, to be powder puffs down there. you got to go when, when it's time to go. You know, they ask you to throw four days in a row. Well, you know what? You have to do that. So, you know, there is some strategy and there is, definitely having what kind of quality you're going to get out of the bullpen by being able to rest guys for so long and, and knowing their patterns, you know, if they like to throw every other day and or get two days off or whatever like that. So, you know, all that comes into in, into uh, account when when your manager and your pitching coach and everybody are talking on the same line. But as far as it goes, I mean, everybody's pretty much the same. You know, they, there's mm-hmm. times where they try and do what they can do, and a lot of times their hands are tied. they got to go with whatever the scoreboard did take. Now, you were in Chicago with Ozzie Guillen, correct? What's that? When you were with the White Sox, you were with uh, Ozzie, right. correct? Right. How, how, was that, how was that experience, by the way? Dude, I love Ozzie. Ozzie gets a bad rap from a lot of media and players sometimes, but to me, I, I love the guy. I mean, in this game, uh, you could probably ask any player. Uh, transparency is, is by far one of the biggest things that we care about. So just letting us know up front. Don't, you know, beat around the bush. All the political stuff that goes on is no fun. But if you tell us how it is and what we need to do, by all means, we can work on that. But if you don't, we'll have no idea. We're not going to perform like you want us to. And with Ozzy, he'd let you know. Some guys couldn't couldn't handle that. You know, they didn't like like being told that, you know, they weren't too good at that time or, or whatever it may be. And me, I loved it. Hey, you need to do this. Okay, now I, need to, now I know I need to do that. And uh, there's a lot of subtle things that he does that people don't realize. For instance, uh, when I was kind of, when I was there, Beckham was a rookie. If he had a bad game or something, you know, did some kind of a bonehead mistake or something like that. Ozzy would intentionally make some kind of a scene of some sort, take all the pressure off the Beckham issue, let him play his game. Don't let, let you know, don't let the media eat him up. Let that 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 attention turn to Ozzy. So I, I think he's he's a, a genius in his own way, and um, you know he's not not necessarily from this country, so he doesn't understand all the the working of the politically correct kind of stuff. But to me, I, I really respect that, that he can go out in front of the whole nation, whole world, and say what he feels and what's on his heart. And, you know, he gets chastised for it a lot of times. But to me, I mean, that's that's transparency right there. You know what you're going to get. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it always seems like you've been manager. It just depends on the big manager. I mean, you go say about Ozzy while, you know, another player, you know, and, so, I mean, the, the manager, to me, I, just just looking high, it just depends on the players he's dealing with. Am I right about that? Are you you're talking about what decisions he's going to make on the field and all that? No, just like, like cause a, lot, a lot of times the, the players, especially when it comes to Ozzy, some either like him, some hate yeah. him. And it just seems to me it would be like a personality deal. Like, you know, it depends on the player, depends on the players he's dealing with, it depends on his clubhouse, so to speak. Right. I mean, it's it's always, it's like that any. Well, I mean, you you and your host got to, professional relationship you guys have to do on the air, whether you like each other or not, you tolerate each other at the field. And, you know, a lot of times in baseball, it's not your typical nine-to-five job where you have a boss and you have to conform. A lot of these guys were the top dogs coming in, and they were treated mm-hmm. a certain way, and they expected they'll be treated that way. And, you know, everybody was their own top dog at some point. And when they meet right. a personality they don't like, they don't know how to deal with it sometimes. So they... You know, well, that guy is this and that guy is that. So, it's just, uh, I don't, I don't see anything wrong. So I've seen all types of personalities, and it is what mm-hmm. it is. And you, you got to try and make it work. And those that don't, they clash. Mm. A lot was made last season, uh, you know, with Terry Francona and the Boston Red Sox, uh, and, and some of the reports that came out that uh, you know he pretty much had a lax clubhouse. You know, veterans. Uh, you know, the veterans were kind of you know allowed to come and go as they please. You know, as long as you know, as long as their attention on the uh, attention to detail on the field was still there. Uh, you know, I, I'm curious. Uh, you know, is, you know, is that is, was that overblown? 
Uh, you know, our, our major league clubhouse is pretty much uh, kind of ran the same way. Uh, you know, some you know some managers have different styles, but for the most part, I mean, is that kind of the atmosphere in the major league clubhouses? Well, for the most part, I'd say yes. I mean, it, there's always the fact that you know you have an owner of a club, you have the club, you need to respect their wishes as far as looking professional and representing that club that you're on. Um, a lot of older guys know what it takes for them to, to perform at this level. And, you know, they like, they like to take the younger guys under their wing and kind of show them the same things, and they'll develop their own habits. And mm. by that, you know, you're kind of doing your own thing, but at the same time, you are working. You're not just not doing anything. Now, you know, we go through spring training, and we bust our butt. We do all these drills. We get everything going. And when you play every day it's and, be, and you know, take BP, there's really not a lot of, like, well, we need to be working on this. We need to be doing that because just yesterday you played a game and the day before you played a game. You know, 150 games later, you're, you know, in, in August, you know, counting the spring training games or whatever it may be. Um, so you, you're doing stuff, whether you're getting there early and taking extra ground balls. You know, that, you know, a lot of that doesn't have to be done all the time if you've done it forever and, you're, and you know what, what you need to do to, to be ready to perform that night. But I can imagine that, uh, you know, especially in August and, you know, a- after going through spring training in the first couple months of the season, uh, you know, you guys have been around each other for, you know, quite a long time. Uh, you know, especially right. on the road, there's you know there's a, you know, there's always that need to kind of break up the monotony. I can under I can understand it if you know players are kind of sick of seeing each other. Uh, you know, I, I think that just kind of comes with the territory. Yeah, uh, like I said, like I was talking about earlier, just the personality deal, and and teams have their cliques. You know, some guys get along better with some guys. You know, some guys sure. like to get up early and have breakfast. Some don't. Some want to sleep in. You know, some want to eat at the park. I mean, it's it's just kind of it's, it's like anything. You find what you have in common with somebody and kind of form a bond, you know, you form a bond and you hang out and that's what you do. It gets you through the year because a lot of these guys, you know, you see them on TV, oh, they're having fun, they're doing this and that, but they're also away from their family. Their kids are going to school away. I mean, they're missing yep. that yep. life too. So they're mm-hmm. trying to fill up that extra time that they're not at work with some kind of a happiness or some kind of something to give, you know, keep them busy and, and not just hang around and do nothing. Who, who is like that doing nothing too, so... <laughs> <laughs> Who was that one guy for you? Uh, you know the, the you know the one guy, or maybe it was a group of guys that uh, you know you've established a uh, uh, you know a good solid uh, friendship over the years. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you, you know who who was that guy for you? I mean, there's always one or two guys on every team. So there's, I mean, sure. you keep in touch, but again, you're with, like you said, you're with them every day, day in and day out. When I was with the White Sox, it was Linebrink. When I was with the Diamondbacks, it was Noberto. With the Pirates, it was Evan Meek. Um, you name it. So every team I've been on, it's it's been, you know, somebody or another that you just hang out with and you guys share, you know, stuff in common and, and go eat together. And, and, you know, you try and have these bullpen dinners to keep everybody together and stuff like that. And, sure. uh, you know, those are just things that hopefully the older guys are showing the younger guys those kind of deals. And, uh, you know, it forms lifelong friendships. I mean, I still keep in touch with everyone old guys I just told you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, DJ, we're in the, uh, we're in the dog days. Everyone's talking about I'm really interested to get a, a, a viewpoint from a guy that's been in a bullpen. What are the bullpen going through this way? This Those that aren't necessarily on, on teams that have a good starting rotation. What are, what, what are the bullpen guys going through right now? Well, hopefully, and I'm pretty sure they all are, they can watch a game and, you know, it's not done, but typically that phone should never have to ring. Everybody in that bullpen is watching the game come the fifth inning, um, they know exactly who's up. They're looking at the lineup. The left-handed specialist is like, I'm probably going to have this guy, this guy, this guy. Uh, the eighth, uh-huh. ninth inning guys know they're in it. So it's just basically all second. I mean, it's just it's like second nature at this point. There's really all the roles are filled in. Somebody goes down, you know, so they'll bring somebody up kind of deal. So it's excitement, mm-hmm. man. Everybody's pulling for each other, especially, you know, if they're in the hunt right now. And, and it's, it's go time. Mm-hmm. This is what everybody plays all year to do. Well, DJ, I do want to thank you for coming on the program. Uh, but before we go, I, I, I want to let you know that uh, we do have a couple open bullpen spots uh, this upcoming season up here in Seattle. <laughs> okay. So well, keep, that, well, keep, keep that in mind when uh, you know when the uh, when the calls start coming in. I know that uh, you prefer to be in the American League. I, you know, and don't you know? Let's be perfectly honest. The Mariners probably aren't going to be in contention next season, and I know that probably right. does that probably will play a play a factor into your decision. But I'm going to let you know. It'd be nice to see you uh, uh, in that bullpen in uh, 13 up in Safeco. That would be pretty, man. I, I've always loved playing there, and uh, it, it's a 
pretty cool situation with Tacoma right there next to it and, and all the mountains mm-hmm. and, you know, all the Bellevue and everything. They, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, who knows? We'll see once uh, season's over and winter meetings go by and see what everybody's trying to do and what offers I have. And I just want to tell you guys thanks for having me on this uh, the show, and God bless you guys. Absolutely. Most definitely. We hope to, uh, we hope to get you on uh, maybe in the off season uh, or uh, closer to the, uh, uh, the ending of the season. Sure. Absolutely. Thanks, right, you DJ. Have a great day. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. DJ Carrasco. Fantastic interview. Great guy. Oh, Fantastic yeah. guy. Yeah. Absolutely. Really? It, it, it was interesting. I, you know, you know, I asked him that Ozzy Gian question for you know for a reason. Uh, you know, uh-huh. I, I wondered, and, and, and I kind of held back a little bit, and, uh, and again, I apologize for all those listeners that are tuning in. Usually I don't do that, but, uh, you know, he seems like he has a, 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 a very good respect, a good, uh, good friendship with Ozzy Gian. And, and, and I was really kind of curious if he would, you know, maybe kind of uh, indulge us a little bit about, you know, Ozzy's personality. Because, you know, the Chicago media – you know, it, you know, it, 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 it's kind of, you know, it, it's, it, it's much like New York to a point where, you know, you know, characters can be created through the media. And I wondered, I always wondered if Ozzy Guillen, you know, was that type of personality where maybe he hammed it up a little bit for the media. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could definitely see that. And it's always nice to get that, just that from the, from the clubhouse viewpoint on that issue. We, we, you know what a player says, maybe what a former player says. We go off with members of the media that are in the club out there. But it's nice to get that viewpoint from a guy that's actually played for him. You know what I mean? I, I got it in there with Oz, and, uh, you know, just the viewpoint from a guy that's been there. I mean, I know there's just no other way to say it. That's just, that's just awesome. Uh, I was really, really interested to hear what, uh, what he had to say about what the bullpens are going through right now because when we look, August, it's August, and bullpen guy – Overwork. Some of them are underwork. Some of them haven't seen very much time lately. Some of them are a little antsy. Some of them have a tired, a tired arm. Some don't. So, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a fantastic interview. Uh, certainly a lot of insights there. Especially, yeah, you know, I think he made a going back to Strasburg about pack on the ball. You take that horse out that giving you seven, eight, nine innings uh, in every one of his starts. You take that guy out, replace him with the guy that only goes start to get a bullpen impact, and, and that's and we're pulling Strasburg out this late in the season is problematic for the Nationals because you're taking the horse out, you're going to overload your bullpen now, your bullpen is key if you make the playoffs, and, and he brought up last year's playoffs, especially with the Rangers. That bullpen is the reason why the Rangers made the World Series, and you take you take that bullpen out, you have an, uh, an overworked bullpen, that you're in trouble, and that's something the Nationals are going to have to. They're going to have to figure out. These they're going to have to figure this out because they're taking Strasburg out. You're going to replace him with a guy that's not going to be as dominant. It's not going to go as many innings. It's major bullpen. Mhm. I, I would agree. I would agree, Bo. Uh, switching gears. Bring in our second guest, a credentialed media member of those uh, beloved Atlanta Braves, lifelong Braves fan. So much so he's got a radio show called Braves Banter. Joining us on the program, Dan Schlossberg. Good morning, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? Uh, no complaints, man. Beautiful weather up here in the, uh, uh, in the beautiful city of Seattle. Uh, no complaints, man. Good summer day. Yeah, I wish I were there because it's pouring here in New York. Oh, surprising a little bit. Well, that's because the Braves are in town. Last year, Hurricane Irene wiped out two Braves men's games. Oh. <laughs> well, I know, I, I know during the... Uh, I know during the, uh, the, you know, the, the early morning pre-interview when I was talking to you, you were, uh, you were a little bit concerned about those Braves heading into uh, New York, and I, I think it was more, of, more along the lines of you were going to be there uh, more so than the Braves were playing the Mets. Well, both, because last year Hurricane Irene wiped out two games in a row, as I mentioned, and the Braves seem to have lost their timing as far as hitting and pitching. That's when their big slump started, when they frittered away that 10-and-a-half game wild card lead. It was right after that Hurricane Irene interval, which was in late August last year. Mm. Well, Dan, speaking of those uh, speaking of those Braves, four and a half games behind in the division, they're leading the wild card right now. They're eighth in the National League in, uh, in offense, hitting two fifty six, on base percentage of three twenty eight, and on base plus slugging of seven thirty one. Sixth in the National League in pitching, three point seven four ERA. Opponents hitting two fifty one off of them, 
and they're third in the National League in bullpen. I was talking to a uh, I was talking to a friend of mine. I'm sure you know who Fred Hickman is. Oh yeah. And he ba- he basically said, "Listen, this team is built for a second. This team is built for a second half run. Always has been." And uh, you know he you know the Braves right now are haven't even hit their stride. I mean, you know when you look at the numbers and and, and you think about their position right now, you know it, it, is that something that you agree with? Yeah. Look at one guy, Dan Ugla. Look what he did last mm-hmm. year over the second half versus what he did over the first half. And he's just coming around now. He's just starting to hit the last week or so. He's really showing signs. And if this one guy starts to hit, he will provide the right-handed power that is missing from that lineup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, and, you know, more so, you, this is, you know, this next question is more so geared to the pitching staff, uh, specifically the starting rotation. Uh, you know, it, it finally seems that Tim Hudson has kind of, you know, kind of got out of his early season fog. He started the season on the DL, came back, and didn't necessarily have a, uh, you know, a great rhythm. But, you know, over the last five starts, you know, the numbers have started to, uh, started to come down. Uh, you, know, you, know, what impact, uh, you know, what what impact has he had over the last five, uh, and especially with a guy with the addition of a, a guy like Ben Sheets at the top of that rotation? Well, the Ben Sheets thing was a great find. I've got to start there because that was unbelievable. Uh, Sheets is 4-1. and one. He's pitched brilliantly, really, and every time out, even, even the game he lost. Um, Tim Hudson has been a little bit more erratic. In fact, this week in his last start in Philadelphia, he frittered away a 6-1 to lead, which is very, very unusual for Tim Hudson. He hit a two-run double during the game, maybe running to second base, knocked him out. I don't know what it was. But he gave up a five-run inning to the Phillies that allowed them to tie the game before the Braves went on to win. But Tim Hudson is not 100% reliable as the ace of the staff. I think by the mm-hmm. end of the season, you might see Ben Sheets as the ace of the staff. We'll see what happens. Wow. And that would be uh, that would be quite interesting, to be honest with you. I mean, is there any you know is there any worries about uh, Sheets' durability? I mean, let's be perfectly honest. The guy hasn't uh, you know the guy hasn't been able to pitch healthy in what six years? Well, not six. Well, really, the last two years, up until resigning with the Braves. But on the other hand. That's a heck of a long time he had a rest, too. So, I mean, two That's years true. of rest, you know. I mean, some pitchers complain about not having enough time between starts, even with four or five days. And Ben Sheets has had two years. I think he'll be fine. <laughs> well, okay. So, <laughs> well, you know, because it, it, to me it seems, it seems a little funny. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a guy who, you know, really had rotator cuff injuries. Uh, and, and this is, you know, this isn't exactly Tommy John. You know where you know where you know pitchers have have had a you know had a long string of uh, success of coming back from it. You know rotator cuff uh, injuries. There's not a lot. There's, there's a very small sample size when it comes to uh, uh, you know uh, coming back and, and being able to uh, come back and pitch healthy. I, I think we're seeing it this year in Jake PV and uh, you know uh, in Chicago, and that's nice. But again, I mean, there's always going to be that, that durability issue, and especially you know he hasn't pitched in a long time, so you always have to think about the rust factor. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. But if you look at the Braves and look where they are, look at their system, look who's on the DL, look who's in the minor leagues, Mm -hmm. the Braves probably have more starting pitching depth, I would dare to say, than any team in the major leagues. Tommy Hansen's on the DL. Brandon Beachy had uh, Tommy John surgery, so he's out. He's not going to come back this Mm -hmm. year. Tommy Hansen will. Uh, Jair Jurgens, who should have probably started the 2011 All-Star game, who's the best pitcher in the National League first half of last year, he's still in AAA. He's rehabbing. You know, Julio Tehran was 15-3 and three in AAA last year, still pitching at Gwinnett, still a great prospect. Randall Delgado is down at Gwinnett, great prospect. I mean, the Braves, you know, they're going to have a lot of starting pitching going down that stretch. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting that you, you know, you, uh, you, you use the term deep in, uh, you know, the Atlanta Braves pitching staff. Uh, you know, a lot of people, and including myself, you know, really kind of looked at the Washington Nationals as a team, you know, you know especially when they brought in uh, uh, Gio Gonzalez from the A's. Uh, they brought in Edwin Jackson and, and some of the pieces that they had returning. You know, it really kind of, you know, it really kind of showed the overall strength of their uh, depth in their rotation, uh, and especially in that bullpen as well, too. Uh, it, it, you know, now that we're, you know, you know, now that we're kind of getting to the stretch run, I mean, and, and things have kind of played out over the, you know, the, you know, the half of the season. Do you, I mean, do you still, I mean, are, are you still in that, uh, are you still more inclined to take Atlanta over Washington at, at this point? Yes, very much so. Uh, for lots of reasons, not just pitching, but even, even with yep. pitching. And the main factor is, I'll give you one word, experience. The Nationals have never mm-hmm. been there. The only guy who's been, been there, there yep. is Davey Johnson. 
I mean, the manager. Mm-hmm. I and mean, the rest of the team hasn't been there. It's a really big thing. The Braves are there almost every year. They're in pennant mm-hmm. contention or, or divisional title contention, let's say. Mm-hmm. The, the Nationals haven't been there. And if, they, if you take Steven Strasburg out of the equation, which they say they will, although Strasburg denies it himself, you know, that's going to make a major difference. Mm-hmm. You're, you are in and around this team quite a bit, I take. Uh, you know, you know Freddie Gonzalez. You know Frank Wren, the general manager. Do they still talk about last season? Uh, no, and, and the, no. Uh, and, okay. they, they will. If I, it I, happens I would, again, and if they start, they start another losing streak. Yeah, they'll they'll start talking about. it. They'll start thinking about it. I really, I think these guys are past it. They've got some new pieces. Okay. They've got Paul Mahalam and Reed Johnson from the Cubs. Yep. They, they've got some other guys who weren't there last year, and that makes a difference too. Yeah, and, and the reason why I ask is because, you know, when a team, you know, generally speaking, when a team goes through what the Braves did last season, uh, you know, it, it has some lingering effects, especially this late in the season when, you know, when you start getting to that point again. And, and, I, and I was curious about it because I really wanted to know about this mentality about, you know, whether or not they still think about it or whether or not they're using that as motivation to not let this happen again. I think the only thing they're thinking about is Chipper Jones. One of the things, I interviewed Chip Carey on my show last night, Braves Manter, sure. and Chip said, I can't believe that Chipper Jones only has 23 games left to play in Atlanta in his career. Hmm? That's all the, that's yeah. the number of home games the Braves have left in the schedule, 23. Oh, uh, is, is there any, uh, just out of curiosity, is there going to be any, uh, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, swan song celebration, uh, you know, for Braves fans to, uh, you know, down the stretch as, uh, the, you know, the season uh, get, uh, comes to a close? Probably not, because the way it's looking, the last three games of the year, the Braves are in Pittsburgh. And those two teams very likely could be playing off for the wild card spot. So if, if it isn't decided yet, or even if it is decided yet, the, the Braves' last home game, which would be the Atlanta fans' last chance to honor Chipper Jones, would be before the race is decided. That's very likely to happen. Mm-hmm. Well. Okay, so let's uh, you know let's sh- uh, let's shift gears a little bit, Dan, and uh, you know let's talk about let's talk about this two uh, you know this two team race at the top of the National League East, the Washington Nationals, uh, you know, getting very close to the 160 inning limit uh, for Steven Strasburg, and I got to be perfectly honest with you, I, I I I'm not, I understand the need to uh, you know to protect your long term investment. I get that, but then again, the Nationals are in a position where they haven't been since '81, when they were you know when they were the Montreal Expos. You know, right. this, you know, this is you know, this is a territory that they're unfamiliar with, as you you know, as you alluded to just a, a couple seconds ago. And I, 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 what type of impact is this going to have on the, have on the uh, on, on this race? Once he gets shut down at 160 innings, are the Braves looking at this? You know, are they foaming at the mouth, just thinking, okay, well, we're only four and a half games, four and a half games back, and they're about to they're about to lose their best pitcher. Well, they're not exactly foaming at the mouth. The Braves aren't. Also, the Braves have done very well as a team against Steven Strasburg, if you look at the record. That's one team that's really given him trouble. I don't know why, but they have. So I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, as I said, experience is a very big factor, and that's going to matter a lot. And I just hope the history isn't repeating itself, because the weather forecast for New York for today and for tomorrow, the Braves could again have consecutive rainouts, just as they did last year with Hurricane Irene, also in the month of August. It's unbelievable the history is repeating itself. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, I look at this race, and, yeah, Strasburg – coming out of that rotation, it's going to be a big blow to the, to the Nationals. But I, I honestly think that the, the way this race is shaping up, the Braves are hot on their heels. I think the Braves can catch them whether Strasburg's in that rotation or not. Am I wrong about that? Well, if they keep playing teams like the Astros, the Nationals can't lose. The Nationals, <laughs> I mean, the Astros just gave it away on a silver platter. I mean, that, that one game, that very first game in the series, I think it was, they made four errors. They were only charged with three, but they made four errors in the 11th inning. Give me a break. You know, three to two, they lost. I mean, stuff like that. And if you know, if the Astros had a, you know, just played better defensively and didn't play like, like a little league team, they would have they would have split that series. They would have won two of the four games. Hmm. <laughs> hey, Steve, I'm not the only one that's going to get the Astros on this show. Nah, that's true. But you can't spell <laughs> disaster without Astro. <laughs> Yeah, and Harold Harold pitched last night. He pitched very well. In his last start before this, he beat the Braves three to two. So this guy's a pretty good young pitcher. The Astros do have some good young players. However, most of them are Triple A players, and they don't belong in the major leagues. How do you how do you see this shaking out, uh, Dan? Uh, you know, 
you know, Washington does, you know, does have a lead, but it's not insurmountable. Uh, and you know what, from everything, you know, from everything that I, you know, read from the people that I talked to, they're, ex you know, they're expecting the Braves to, uh, you know, pretty much make a run, catch them. And not only that, but, you know, seal this thing up. Uh, and, it, and it's, again, it, it's because of the experience that you keep alluding to, you know, how do you see this playing out over the last month and a half? Well, for one thing, the Braves have to be able to beat the Nationals. They have quite a few games remaining with them. I'm looking at the schedule right now. It looks like there are six games remaining between the Braves and the Nationals. So the Braves have to win four of them, five of them. We'll, we'll see how it goes. So it's a matter of the Braves really can't get help from anybody else. They've got to do it on their own. They've got to win their games. They've got to win their series. And, you know, hope that the Nationals come down to earth a little bit. With Strasburg out, if they do take him out after 160 innings, That'll make a difference, but we'll see. And Gio Gonzalez, yes, that was a big find for Washington. And he's a good hitter, too, by the way. He hit a home run in his last game. <laughs> speaking, uh, uh, you know, speaking of the, this division, you, know, you watch this division uh, you know, very closely. Has, has this division played out uh, so far in, uh, the, the way you expected it this year? I didn't think Philadelphia was going to fall flat on its face. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. unbelievable. They got old in a hurry. I mean, everybody sure, was saying yeah. going, going into the season, Philadelphia's going to win. They've got a veteran team. They've got that great pitching staff. But you know what? That, Roy Oswalt was never re-signed. Cliff Lee mm -hmm. got hurt. He c couldn't win a game for half the season. You know, Roy Halladay got hurt, and he really wasn't pitching like Roy Halladay. You know, you take those things into consideration. Plus, they didn't have Howard and Utley for half the year. And so they, they showed their age in a hurry. And then well, once they fell so far behind, they decided to get younger and to get some money off the payroll. I think they're going to make a very big splash in the free agent market this winter because they've got a lot of money to play with now. So if that happens, mm -hmm. the Phillies will be right back there next year probably. As far as the Mets go, they're a pretty weak ball club. I mean, they have pretty good pitching, but you know, beyond that, they don't have a lot. After David Wright and perhaps Ike Davis, who had a bad first half, he's just starting to come around. But the Mets outfield in particular is, is pretty shaky. And Ruben Tejada is having a great year, but, you know, it doesn't have the power that Jose Reyes does. So the Mets, I didn't mm -hmm. think the Mets were going to do much. The Marlins, now the Marlins are an interesting team. When they signed Reyes and Heath Bell and Mark Burley, I thought the Marlins were the best team in the National East. I thought they were going to win this year. They obviously didn't. They fell on their face early. Uh, Stanton got hurt, which didn't help things. And, you know, Heath Bell was terrible. I mean, one of the, probably mm. the worst closer in the major leagues for half the year. So then the Marlins just pulled the plug, and I think they, you know, very suddenly made their decision to sell sell the team again. They've done this before. You know, they did mm. it after 1997 when yep. they won the World Series. Oh, yeah. They did it after 2003 when they won the World Series. So mm -hmm. the Marlins well, have a history, but you would think that with a new ballpark and you know they were trying to do so much in that area, and they thought they'd get so much money with the new ballpark and all the free agent signings, and they just pulled the plug. So, who knows? I, it's, it's different I wonder, than anybody thought. I wonder about that new ballpark as well, too, because there's always an adjustment period when, you, when, you're, when, you're, you know, when teams go from, you know, from old to new. I knew that, that you know, playing in Pro Player Stadium down there in Miami, you know, it, it really was you know, uh, uh, tailor-made for, uh, uh, for right-handed hitters short porch out there in left field, and then you go, you go into the new ballpark, and it's very, you know, you know th that outfield is very expansive. And, and, I was, and when I watched the Marlins, it really, it really looked like for the first two months, it was an adjustment period for them, just trying to feeling out, you know, what, what you can and can't do in that park. I guess that's true, but you have to say the same thing for the visiting teams, too. Plus, the fans were very enthusiastic, thinking, oh, this is the year the Marlins are going to win again. Well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well... Dan, I, I do want to thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. So be, you know, before we let you go, you are taking the Braves, uh, am I right? Oh, yeah, definitely. By how much? How, how much are they going to win this division by? Oh, let's say four games. All right, well, I'm hoping wow. you do that. We're, 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 going to get you, we're going to get you back on as, uh, as we get closer to the playoffs, and hopefully your prediction comes true. All right, thanks very much. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. That was Dan Schlossberg, Braves banner. Got to love it. Yep. That's an enthusiastic Braves fan right there. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially, he's talking about an eight-game swing in the standings. I mean, I, I think the Braves are going to pass them too, but I don't know if I'm going to go that far. I will say this, though. The Washington Nationals, 
I know that I'm making a mole, mountain of a, I, I could be making a mountain out of a mole here right here with Steven Strasburg. I understand the depth. I get it. I understand the bullpen. They have a fantastic bullpen, by the way. I get that. Yeah. And, and that's, gonna, that's going to play a huge factor in this thing. I'm not going to sit here and say that you know, the loss of Strasburg is going to be so, you know, so impactful that you know, that's, this team is going to wilt because I still think it's a playoff team, whether it's the division title or whether it's a wild card team, because, again, you know, right now they're sitting with, what, the best record in the National League. Am I wrong? Best record in baseball right now. Yeah, best record in baseball. Thank you. And, and so the interesting yep. thing about this, though, th- this, isn't, this isn't just about, you know, chasing a division title. You, you, if you're sitting there with the best record in baseball and probably one of the better pitching staffs in the major leagues, it's not an issue of division uh-huh. or wild card. It's an, issue, it's an issue about thinking a little bit, thinking a little bit of ahead and, making, you know, and, and kind of forecasting exactly, you know, you know, what, you know what, your playoffs is, what your playoffs are going to look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the I Yankees agree. are doing it. The Yankees are doing it. The, uh-huh. I'm sure the Rangers are probably doing it. You know, and, and I think that you know, I, I think that I, you know, I think the Strasburg effect is going to be a big one. It's going to be a huge effect, huge effect, and I still, I get it. Okay, you, you don't want to blow out his arm. I understand that, but it, it, what, if, if he's not, if he's feeling strong, if he's feeling good, is it really at risk of blowing out his arm? I mean, honestly, is it, I mean, to me, this is, <laughs> yeah, hey. you don't. You know, we're going to cut you off at 160 regardless. Say, okay, how you doing? Anything at all? Well, oh, oh, okay, so here's the thing. You see what happened to Chris Sale in Chicago. Uh, he's got yeah. dead arm. All right, so yeah. you know that's you know th- you know that's the things that you you kind of prevent against, and that's you know that's why they have the you know the inning deadline. But here's the thing: if you mm-hmm. stretch him out, if you know if you if you you know instead of letting him throw seven, you throw five and a third. You know, instead of you know, instead of going on every once every five days, you go once every six days. You skip a start here and there, especially right around the All Star break. You 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 conserve some energy for the back end of the season. And you know yeah. what? And, and especially and here's the point: especially if you skip a start every once in a while, you you, you don't bring in that dead arm effect. You you, you kind of take injury. You try to minimize injury as much as you possibly can. You know that's right. you know that's that's not only that's only not, that's that's not only looking out for your season, but it's also looking out for your future as well because you're not necessarily you're, you're not necessarily throwing them every five days. You're not throwing them into the fire like Chicago did with Sale. Well, and I think I think too. I mean, you're talking about Strasburg who's been a starter his whole career. I think there's yep. a little bit of a difference there with, because of stretching sure. out like no. that. You know, I, I, sure. get your point. I, get, I get your point, and and that's out. But you mean, maybe maybe because you know I'm down here in Texas and I've got Nolan Ryan. Going on a on a jihad against any limits and pitch limits. Okay. He's did you really go? Did, did you really did you really go there? You went jihad. I did. I did. Okay. <laughs> I'm just giving you. I'm just giving you a hard time, Bo. <laughs> I know that. But it's basically what he's done. He, he's just gone on the offensive against pitch counts and against any limits. What he's done is from the from the bottom of the Rangers minor league system all the way through. He's making the pitcher stronger. He's increasing their workload as they're sure. younger, making their arm stronger. That's the way sure. that he would believe, and that's the way that, frankly, a, a lot of teams are starting to try and get to. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm still not quite sure why they've got him on such a limit. I I don't I don't get it. You know, they, they probably know something I don't, which is fine. Okay, that's like you said, you, you stretch it out because you're, you're talking about taking. You, you're the best team in baseball. You got you got. A, you're three games better than the best American League team. You're four and a half games up in your division. You're on your way to the playoffs. Maybe sit him down. I got no problem sitting him down for a start or two. But completely mm-hmm. shutting him down, completely shutting him down, to me, it's just, it's like saying, okay, we, we kind of want to win the World Series, but we care about next year more. Mm-hmm. That's like me. Turning to the phone lines, if you want to go ahead and give us a call, the number is 714-202-9918. We're taking calls for the last 20 minutes. If you want to go ahead and give us a call, National League East Talk. Go ahead. Don't necessarily have to keep it confined to the National League East because we're about to switch gears back to the American League West. Some people have just asked us, why don't we just rename the show Inside the American League West, which is a good point, <laughs> considering that's what we talk about 50% of the time. You can also reach us on Twitter. At Insider Steve, at Let's Talk Rangers. And if you want to know where Bo's allegiance is, just look at his Twitter handle. 
Let's talk Rangers. But we're not going to do that. We're going to talk 80s. Because, again, they had a huge series against the Angels this week. Big three-game series. I know, a lot of, I know a lot of Rangers fans were really watching that series. Oh, yeah. you know, all eyes were on that series. And you know what? I, I got to be honest with you. If you, needed, if you needed any more convincing from the Oakland A's standpoint, you just had to look at that three-game three series against the Angels. It was a statement win, statement series for the Oakland A's. Because you know what? A lot of people thought this team was cute. A lot of people thought, thought this team was, you know, you know, you know, the, the, first, you know the first half wonders, you know, but uh, really the lack of talent was going to uh, really kind of catch up with them. You know, the, lack, the, the fact that they really don't have a lot of power in that lineup to really kind of hang with the big boys in the, in the American League, you know, they're winning in spite of that. Their pitching, their, their pitching has been great. Probably some of the best pitching, you know, that we've seen in the American League this year. They're very consistent. Their bullpen is lights out. And you know what? They're manufacturing right now in this series. You know, they opened, you know, they opened up uh, you know, losing to Jared Weaver, which was pretty much a foregone conclusion because Weaver probably is your American League Cy Young Award winner this year. You know how I feel about that, and I'm, I'm all on Felix Hernandez's coattails on that one. I think he's actually, you know, he, he, you know me per, uh, that's probably my homerism coming out and, and nothing more and more, nothing more. But, you know, the A's dropped the first game in that series. They come back and they score 19 runs in the next two games, and then they end up taking two out of three. Yeah. Yeah, they took two out of three. And, and like I said earlier, that was – we both said it. It was a statement series by the A's. I mean, if you, if you think about it, you know, the Angels and the A's are in a dogfight right now for a wild card spot. Uh, the emergence mm-hmm. of the Tigers and the White Sox, okay, maybe the Orioles in the East, they're, they're starting to come on strong, makes it less likely that they can both make the playoffs. So, yeah, that was, that was head-to-head against your prime competition for a playoff spot. The mm-hmm. A's passed – that's with flying colors, and you know the A's have have things that the Angels don't. Yeah, the Angels have a better offense, you know, but the A's have enough offense, and they have enough offense because their pitching is that much better. It's the best pitching in the American League on that team, maybe even a baseball. Mm-hmm. The best starting rotation, you got the deep bullpen. It's a, it's a team that can short the game, like we always talk. About. You want to have a yeah. bullpen that allows you to short the game to five or six innings. They've got that. They've got yep. that, and they've got just enough offense with the Spetters in the middle of that order. They have just enough offense. And I think probably one of the most underrated moves of, of, of so far was bringing in Brandon Inch. Yeah. They no, the back. You don't, yeah. Yeah. I, I, Look at when the A's but, started their when they got that's when That's when the A's really started to play good baseball was back when they got in. That's when they started to turn things around. They started scoring more runs. Their pitching has mm-hmm. been phenomenal. And it's it, it showed me exactly what I thought the two teams, the difference the two teams were. The Angels' bullpen did them in again. The bullpen cost them two games in Texas. It cost them two games in Oakland. Mm-hmm. That's a problem, and that's the biggest part. And, and the Angels have – they haven't used any chances they had whatsoever to fix that bullpen. They got a Fieri in the beginning of the season. That was a good move. Can you imagine the team if they hadn't made that move? Imagine this bullpen without that guy. Yeah. Well, which – it, this is the funniest thing about this team. Here's the funniest thing about this team. You look at it on paper. It just it, it boggles my mind. You know, you talk yeah. about you on a Cespedes, but I mean, this is their outfield: Coco Crisp in center, and Josh Josh Reddick. You know the the, the you know the, the scrap heap fielder that the Red Sox threw in in that uh, in in that Andrew Bailey deal. Is their starting right fielder and happens to lead you know happens to lead that team in most pa- right. in most power categories. Right. Their third baseman is Brandon Inge. Again, scrap heap, scrap heap pickup from the Detroit Tigers. There's enough value left in them that Billy Bean picked them up. Eric Sogard uh-huh. at shortstop, Jamal Weeks uh-huh. at second base. You got uh, you got a combination of Carter and Moss at first base. Johnny Gomes, <laughs> Seth Smith. The list goes on and on and on and on. It's, it, you, you look at this team, and, and it boggles your mind. This, is, this, this really is the, uh, the, the fictitious Cleveland Indians. It is. It is, but it's nothing else, Steve. It's Moneyball 2.0. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't know Moneyball about that. It, it's Moneyball 2.0. He found the right role players for the team. Okay. But the entire team is role players, though. The entire team is role players. 
from, from outside the organization, though. You know, I, I, you know when, when we talk about Moneyball, and again, you know, we had this conversation on Monday, Bo, you know, uh, about you know, Moneyball, Moneyball version 2.0. Well, listen, Moneyball is always about player development. It's, it, it's, about, it, it, it's about drafting, uh, you know, in a certain way with a, with a, with, you know, with a mathematical equation, you know, that, uh, you, know, right. you, know, to, you know, to give the A's that advantage. Well, everybody, everybody plays that game now in Major League Baseball. There's nothing to hide as far as that, you know, that equation, you know, for scouting. So, I mean, really, right. Moneyball, that's what it is. It's about player development. And don't get me wrong, yeah, of course, when it comes to free agency, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to finding, you know, plugging gaps, of course, you know, the equation still works. But, you uh-huh. know, the, 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 the biggest issue, uh, you know, with Moneyball, is, is it's a heavy emphasis on, uh, on player development. When you look at this major league roster, more, right. more than, I want to say, three-quarters of this roster came from outside the A's organization. Yeah, and that's fine. That's why I call it Moneyball 2.0. This is Moneyball at the major league level. This is doing the same stuff, but instead of doing it with prospects you're looking to draft and develop, you're doing it with the, the pieces that make it good this year. That's what they did. They hmm. went out. They didn't, they didn't make any, any, any of the sexy signings. Any of the sexy, I think the A's never will. They don't have the payroll. But they got the right guys for that team, guys that fit what they're trying to do, guys that complement each other in that lineup. That's what they hmm. did. And the A's... You know, they've all, we've always said they could just get a little offense to go with that pitcher. They've had good pitching for the past decade. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, this is a team that once had, what, Dan Heron on the team. They had uh, Trevor Cahill, who, mm-hmm. who were the A's, very good. Very, very good. You know, I mean, they, they, they've, had, they've had the pitching, and they, they keep treading away, but they, they bring up even better pitchers every time they do, it seems like. They've always had the pitching. Now they've got just enough offense because we've got that kind of pitching. You don't have to have a Rangers offense, a Yankees offense. You don't have to have that when you've got fantastic pitching. Mm-hmm. Like the, you just need you just need an offense that's going to get you four or five runs again. That's about it. Well, and, and that's what the, and if that's going to win Billy Bean, you know, uh, Executive of the Year, it's because he he recognized his you know his strengths, and uh-huh. he knew that he he wasn't going to be able to miss. Excuse me, he wasn't going to be able to miss a beat. When training right. guys like Gio Gonzalez and Trevor Cahill and Andrew Bailey, probably three guys that most teams would never trade no, in that type of situation. Certainly, certainly not. A but I'll tell you what, you know, him and his, Bean and his staff was able to uncover some gems. I mean, really, who thought Josh Reddick was going to have an impact at the beginning of the season? I didn't think he had this big of an impact, but I thought he'd help. Because I've always been a Reddick fan. I like Josh Reddick. I like that swing. I like that swing a lot, and he's got a lot of power in that swing. He's just going to grow, too. He's going to be even better. He's still developing. Yep. Well, you know, I, I thought the biggest – you know, for me, the, the biggest impact of this series was, it was in that third game when the, you know, yeah. when the A's got to Zach Greinke. Uh, you know, you know we, we touched a little, bit that, a little bit about this at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the program. And, and, again, you know, that was a game that the Angels – it was a must win. Division uh-huh. opponent, you know, and, and, and a loss would, you know, would, would slip you a little bit further back in the standings. This was supposed to be a two-team race between the Angels and the Rangers. Yeah. And there's pressure. There's pressure now. More pressure so on the Angels than there is with the, with the, with the A's. Let's be perfectly honest. The A's, there is no expectation. As a matter of fact, most people thought the A's were going to finish in last. Uh-huh. And here, and here they are sitting two, sitting two and a half games above the Angels right now. The pressure is squarely on Anaheim. And I got to yeah. be perfectly honest. You know, this the, the, these type of series are you know, really kind of really kind of give you an idea exactly where this team has you know, t, you know this team has as far as heart as far as mentality because again you 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 you've seen the Rangers in that type of situation where they'd struggle but against teams that they knew that they needed to beat they beat them. They yeah. know how to show up. To play, yeah, uh huh. Championship Absolutely. teams know know how to show up despite the fact that they're struggling. They can get they can they, you know they can. There's a medium there's a medium pace to it. Even when they're struggling, you know they're they're not bad enough where they still can't they they can't pull out a win. They they, they can't pull out a series. The Angels right. didn't do that. No, they and did the not. A's, you know, know, the, the the A's just the, the A's came into the series but with nothing to lose and they and they beat them two out of three. Yeah, you know, and, and a series that. Uh, Jared Weaver and Zach Grinke both start. That, that's why they got Grinke to win that series. Yeah. To win that, 
that series, that's the kind of series, that's why they got Jack Grinky down the stretch, because that's what they've got to do. They can't lose a series to the A's. They can't, they mm-hmm. honestly, you know, you're, you're sitting seven games behind the Rangers. You're, I think, what, a game and a half behind the A's, something like that, a game and a half, two and a half, some more around there, behind the A's. And it's getting to be and the it, middle part of August. Yeah. Okay, middle part of August. It's time to play baseball. I mean, it's, just, it's time to play baseball. And the Angels have been a very streaky team. They started off terrible. Then they couldn't, they couldn't lose in June and yep. July. And now they're back in August, and they're back to playing the way they have been, it, the, way they, the way they started the season. You know, because it, for, them, for them to win, their starting pitching has to be there, their offense has to be there, and their bullpen has to be there. That, that's the same for every team in baseball, and that bullpen has only been there for one stretch. And you guessed it. It was that June and July stretch. That was the only time their bullpen's mm-hmm. been there for them. And you could see they could be when that bullpen's pitching well. But that bullpen's mm-hmm. not pitching well right. I don't think there's a team in baseball that needed a day off yesterday more than the Anaheim Angels. Mm-hmm. I don't. And now, yeah. and now the, the Angels then now go into a three-game series versus the Mariners. And, again, right. it's the same situation. The Mariners come uh-huh. in, you know, coming off three-game sweep in Baltimore, that's understandable. A Mariners team that really kind of has struggled this season to really kind of, you know, find their identity. At times they have play, played very well, and at times they've played really like their record. But, again, uh-huh. they come in with no pressure. They played the Angels quite well this season. You know, out, outside of, you know, outside of, I believe, of a, uh, of a three-game sweep up in Seattle, I beg your pardon, uh, you know, a, a two out of three up in Seattle, for the most part, the Mariners have played the Angels very well, especially down in Anaheim. Yeah. And, and, and the Angels are on, the, on that brink. There's seven, they're seven games now out, out, out of first place behind the Rangers. If they lose two out of three to Seattle and find themselves eight, nine games out of first place, it's over. It's yeah. over for them. I agree. You can't, they're, they're, it's, it's very hard to make up a nine-game ground to catch. It's, it's incredibly hard. You know, and, and the one thing I look at this race, I, I think the A's are the better team. Honestly, yeah. they don't. They can't match the Angels on offense, but they've got them in starting pitching. And they've got them in bullpen. And if you're going, well, to, and, if you're going to, yeah, better, yeah, and that's and, the yeah, you're going to be better. Uh, that's and, it. And, and, that's, that's it. Well, and let me let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that again. Here's what I mean: for the division, at least, it's over for the Angels. They're not going to be able to catch the Rangers, and probably they're right. not going to be able to catch the. They may catch the A's for second place. But the division, it's over. If they lose two out of three to Seattle, the wild card, on the other hand, is a completely different story. But again, you know, you yeah. still have to deal with the Orioles. You're going to have to deal with the A's uh-huh. again. Yeah. I mean, you know, the what the Tigers are still in that race. You know, so right. really, you know, even the Red Sox are. You know, even the Red Sox could be still in that race as well too. So I mean, you know, for the Angels, you know, they have a t- tough task ahead of them. And I'll tell you what, right now, you know. This is the worst. This is the worst time to be playing in consistent baseball right now. Absolutely the worst. Right. Well, and and you mentioned earlier how championship teams play. Well, yeah. this is the time where championship, championship teams step up and play baseball. And you're starting to see that around the league. The Braves mm-hmm. are coming. On. Okay, the Braves mm-hmm. are coming on. The A's are coming on. The Rangers are coming on. They're hitting again, and that's why they're winning again. Okay, mm-hmm. the Tigers, the White Sox, they're coming on. Okay, the Orioles are coming on, and they're coming on at the right time, and that's and that's this is what a championship team does. You survive the summer, mm-hmm. you get it up, you get into the last six weeks of the season, you make your push. Okay, mm-hmm. right now, if you look at you look at the teams that were expected to be in the playoffs, all of them except for the Angels are making that push and end up going. So we're going. Exactly. That's, that's what we're they, they're they're not exactly. playing their best ball when they have to. Mm-hmm. Play like Notre Dame. Play like a champion today. Uh huh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That was that was right on the tip of my tongue. I was waiting through your entire you know your entire last sentence there to to really kind of put a cap on that uh, uh, put a cap on that sentence right there. But I'll, I'll tell you what. I wanted to hit this right before we go off the air, uh, and it's it's really something that I, I I've been really wanting to talk about. It involves your Texas Rangers. It really does. All right. Okay. What the what what the heck? Is wrong with you, Darvish? Literally, five his last five starts, he's given up twenty six earned runs, twenty six yeah. earned runs while giving up twenty one walks, twenty one walks. 
You know, I, I, before I, before I get into this, before I get into this, I do have to let everyone know that I've enjoyed crow for breakfast for the past three weeks uh, over a certain yeah. pitcher named Scott Feldman. Uh, without Scott Feldman, the A's might be right there with the Rangers. And he's turned it around and been their best pitcher. Now, as far as you go, no mm-hmm. one really knows what's wrong with you guys. Right? The, the problem is his – his breaking stuff is fine. He's still got that outstanding plethora of off-speed pitches, and they're all down. He's controlling them well. But his fastball has gone MIA for the past five starts. Just, just his fastball command has gone. I mean, no one knows why. No one knows mm-hmm. up way with his fastballs. And the adjustment, we, we, we talked talk, talk about this earlier this season, Steve, about how the second half of the season teams are going to adjust. Well, that's been their adjustment. They're making him throw strikes, and he's not throwing strikes. Mm-hmm. He's walking a lot. Of people. He's giving up the. He's giving a little more hits lately than he was, but it still comes down to his fastball. Command. His off-speed stuff is so lethal, so dramatic that when he's spotting that fastball, he's virtually unhittable. But he has not been playing mm-hmm. that fastball. And what's most concerning for me, and, what, and, and in fact, it was concerning enough for the Rangers to have a sit-down conversation with you, Darvish. His presence on the mound has changed dramatically. Early in the season, mm-hmm. he took the ball, said, this is my pitch, let's see if you can hit it. Past couple of starts, and it's, I mean, it's, it's incredibly, you don't even have to watch him every day to notice this. He's been timid. He's been mm-hmm. a, little, a little on edge. You know, he hasn't been that comfortable on the mound, you Darvish, that we, even in the game where he was losing earlier this year, he still had that presence on the mound. He doesn't have any. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's part mm-hmm. of the sit-down conversation with Ron Washington earlier this week, and Wash came out of that saying, the kid's head's on straight. I'm looking for something special out of him down the stretch. Mm. Very quickly, uh, we, are three, we are three minutes away from the end of the program. We are going to go into overtime. Uh, you can definitely check that out on iTunes. Type in, uh, you know, type in uh, MLB inside the numbers. You'll see, it, you'll see it pop up. You can go ahead and click on the link. Fast forward to the end of the program. Uh, and catch the overtime, or you can do it right here on Blog Talk Radio uh, and, uh, you know, just hit play. Uh, but here, here's the thing, though, Bo, and I knew this was going to happen. This happens all the time with rookie pitchers. Their first yep. go-round in the major leagues, they have phenomenal success. The reason? Uh-huh. Because of the unfamiliarity, uh, you know, uh, with the, that hitters have upon them. So usually they're able to, you know, they're able to coast through the first half, much like last year with Michael Pineda, all star. This year, you Darvish, all star. Okay, that's you know that's that was probably a foregone conclusion with a guy of that many talent. But here's what happens: the second time, the, the second go round through the league, players know him. They're familiar. They're familiar with what he's going to do. And people understand that you Darvish, in order for him to work ahead in counts, he's got he's got to have that fastball command. And I'll tell you what, yeah. pitcher, you know, batters are not afraid to 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 wait on that pitch because you know what. Right now, he's not. You know, he doesn't have command of that fastball. So instead of instead of working count strike one, it's usually ball one, and then you Darvish goes to his goes to his assor, uh, you know assortment uh, of pitches. Uh huh. And you know what? They're they're going to wait on his off speed uh, off speed stuff, and it, they end up they end up wrecking him. Absolutely, yeah. and it's it's because of, it's because of the book that they have on him now. People know people know how to adjust to you Darvish. Here's the here's the thing that you Darvish needs to understand that number one. It's nice that you have eight different pitches that you can throw for strikes. That's nice. Uh-huh. It's, it's a nice yeah. thing. But unfortunately, yeah. really, you, you, need to, you need to simplify it. If you know that you can, yeah. throw, a cur- if you, if you can throw a sink, a fastball, a changeup, or a curveball for a strike, pick three and just work with that. Simplify uh-huh. it. Put, your, you know, put yourself in a better position to succeed and adjust to what, the, you know, what offenses have done with you. I mean, I understand that you're a phenom and you can do all these crazy things, but here's the thing: you're not winning ball games right now. Right. And so, I so your that. job is to adjust. And right now, he's not I, being able to do that. And, and I'm telling you what: right now, the Rangers had. The, you know, if I'm Ron Washington, I'm concerned. You gave this dude a hundred million dollars to pitch, and right now he's struggling. Well, that's not what the Rangers are concerned about. It's not about how much they pay. They, they, they invested in him long term, and they. You know, they, they knew that this first season wasn't going to be his best. I think we all knew that, okay? Did I expect him to, to just completely crater like he has the past five starts? No, I didn't see that coming, okay? But he has. 
And you're right. He needs to simplify things. And I've seen him a couple starts. He hasn't, you know, he hasn't thrown that really slow curveball as much. So you can see maybe five. He's trying to simplify things. He's trying to concentrate on his fastball. What the Rangers are concerned about, and rightfully so, is October. That's their concern. They've got. They need mm-hmm. this guy to the dominant U Darvis that they saw in April and May. If they want to go back to the World Series, they've got to have that, and that's their concern. That's mm-hmm. what their concern is. You know, Mike Maddox. One of the, one of the not the best pitching coaches in baseball. I promise you, he's working with him. He's working with a the guy. They're going to get this thing out. It may be a mechanical issue because all of his fastballs, like I said earlier, up and away. All of his fastballs, up and away. Okay? That's a relief point. Mm-hmm. That's a mechanical issue. They've got to fix that. Okay? They get mm-hmm. that fixed. He gets his fastball committed. But it's a little bit, a, a lot like in a way, like I know we're comparing a pitcher to a hitter here, but it's a little bit like Josh Hamilton. Josh Hamilton, when he went through a six, seven-week stretch, he did it because he was swinging at every single pitch, and pitchers do that. So they didn't throw him mm-hmm. a fastball. They didn't throw him a fastball. The exact same thing with you, Darvish. Hitters are sitting on his off-speed stuff because they know he can't spot his fastball right now, and until he starts spotting that fastball, that's exactly what hitters are going to do. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because, again, the the Rangers are in a in a in a very precarious uh, for, uh you know peculiar uh, peculiar situation because number one yes they're leading the division but then again the A's are right on nipping at their heels they're gonna they're yeah. they're gonna need everybody to play like an all star like the, pretty right. much like the all stars that they are yeah and I you know well, I, and, and you know you, I, I, you brought up Mike Maddox and I was going to ask you that question again because you know. Right now, he's probably the most important uh, person in the, on that coaching staff right now. Absolutely, 100%, yes. Yes, he is. Because the hitters know how to hit, and the fielders know how to field. The pitchers, need, they, they need Mike Maddox right now because it's not just you, Josh. It's Derek Collins. Derek Collins had a, a rough patch of starts. Matt Harrison the past couple of games hasn't been as sharp as you want to see Matt Harrison be. So they've got, they've got some issues in that rotation right now that, that frankly, can be fixed. These guys have done it before. Uh, you've seen Derek Holland at his best. You saw it in game four of the World Series. You've seen him at his best. You've seen Matt Harrison at his best. He was an all-star this year. Okay? They, it's not like they suddenly forgot how to pitch. they just got to make some adjustments. They've got to, they've got to fix things mechanically. Derek Holland, for example, is missing. Just, he's, he's nibbling, kind of like C.J. Wilson used to do. He's nibbling around the plate. He's just missing on his inside corner pitches, and that's caused him to come over in the middle of the plate, and he's getting shelled. It's little things. And those things like that, and that's where Mike Maddox comes in. That's why he's so important to this coach. He said that's why they were sweating bullets when he was interviewing with the Cubs in the offseason because they didn't want to lose him for this reason right here. He gets the pitchers back on track. You know, I, I think we've got some. Uh, I think we've got some good series this weekend, Steve. I really do. You know, I'm, I'm, obviously I'll be watching the Rangers and Tigers, which I think is a good AO matchup, so to speak. But uh, we've got some other doozies. We've got a couple in the National League. You know, I mean, we've got. For example, let me see who we got there. Got Atlanta and the Mets. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Washington and Arizona. Okay. You know, Arizona's coming on strong. You're okay. you're Mariners against the Angels. You know, and I'm really interested to see what happens um, after that day off. How they come out of that day off. One series I'm watching in particular. I think it's a fantastic matchup piece. A's and the White Sox. Wild card uh-huh. battle. Playoff positioning, possibly, yeah. between teams. You know, um, Detroit trying to get back into the mix of things in, in terms of seeding in the American League. The Yankees and Blue Jays, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, a fantastic series here this weekend. Well, I will say this, and, and for those that tune in, the uh, our, our faithful three that, uh, you know, that tune in weekly, Understand that, uh, you know, my heart and soul pretty much lives and dies with the Seattle Mariners. I was born and raised up here in the 206. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a struggle. It really is, Bo. I mean, you know, we haven't been to, we haven't been to the postseason since 01. You really haven't had a, a decent winning season since 03. Uh, you know, and, and, this, you know and, and this season, especially as we go through August, there's the doldrums of a rebuild, you know, of a rebuilding season. You know the Mariners. You know the Mariners won seven out of nine on their last home stand uh, against what Kansas City and uh, uh, Kansas City uh, and uh, Toronto. Go on the road, and now they've lost five out of six against Baltimore and New York. What I really like to see is some consistency for the rest of the season. Maybe take a series or two from Texas. Take a series or two from the Angels. You know, play that spoiler. You know, yeah. 
it, it, it's one thing when your team is, you know, lives and dies by the young guys, and that's nice and all. But at the same time, eventually, it's the light has to go on. It has to start clicking a little bit. We haven't seen that this year. I'd like to see the Mariners turn around and, and, and try to make something of the rest of their season. Now, I, I, I'd like, of course, I'd like to see them push the 500 button, but I don't necessarily think that's realistic. But what I, what I would really like is, you know, play your best baseball against the, you know, against the teams that are in this race. Play the spoiler. You know, get, get, some, get some good mojo going for next season. That's what I'd like to what? see. Not not just for the rest of the month of August, but also September. Uh, you know, uh, against Triple. You know, when, when rosters expand and, and you're going to face a lot of Triple A guys, take advantage of the situation. Well, you're getting the Angels three times, you're getting the yep. A's twice, and you're getting the Rangers yep. twice. So yeah, you, the, the Mariners are going to factor in the AL West race, which you know, like like you know, I think that we've all taken notice of what they've yeah. done. Since Ichiro Suzuki has been traded, they've actually started playing a much, much better baseball. And I, for one, I'm not really high on playing the Mariners right now as a Rangers fan. I'm not. I mean, the Mariners, especially the past couple of series, seem to have really played the Rangers well. Uh, they mm-hmm. play the Angels, like you mentioned, in Anaheim. So if there's a team in this division that probably going to make this big <laughs> impact, it's out. Because, you know, the A's, Rangers, and Angels are probably going to beat up on each other down the stretch. Yeah. Uh, the A's. In fact, well, I say that. The, uh, I don't think the Rangers play the A's or the Angels until like the last week and a half of the season. So yep. the Mariners are going to have a huge play in this, in this division. You know, if, if the Rangers and, have a good yeah. August and a good September, and the, and the Mariners also have a good August and a good September, then, yeah, you're going to see a division gap widen. And mm-hmm. the A's and the Angels will be in that dog fight, and the Mariners are going to be that huge monkey wrench that every team in contention hates to face. Mm-hmm. And the Mariners, you know, and the Mariners are playing 500 ball since the All Star break. But here's the most important uh, thing: they have nothing to gain, and they have nothing to lose. Correct. You know, they're, they're they're that team that should be playing with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because you know what, they can salvage the rest of the season, and, and it comes with consistency. But you know, if the, if one thing that they they've seen throughout the course of this season is what it takes to play consistency and that uh, consistently, and that's what I'm looking for. Four and more, you know, I, I don't necessarily even care if they lose, but play consistent. Yeah. If you're going to yeah. lose, you know, I, I don't want to see one game where, you know, where you come out and you, you, know, you, you destroy the Angels, you know, 8-1, but then you come back and lose 9-2. to two. That, I don't want to see that yeah, consistently. If, if you're going to lose, you know, lose right. You know, lose right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got you. I, I understand. And that's – well, that's – Frankly, that's what you're dealing with at this stage of the Mariners rebuild. There are a bunch of kids trying to figure out how to get the major level, and that's the last thing you that's the last mm-hmm. thing you get. Figuring out how mm-hmm. to win. The last piece Absolutely. of your puzzle. And that's what the Mariners are gonna to have to do. That's what they can focus mm-hmm. on down the street. Focus on, you know what? Let's wreck some teams. Let's just go yep. in and wreck teams. And that's they're mm-hmm. in position to do that. They're, they're they're playing a lot of AOS games down the stretch. They're gonna factor in this in this division and that, you know what? If I'm the Angels and I'm the Yanks, and I'm sitting here looking at this division lead, and I'm looking at how the Mariners have played against us, I'm a little concerned. Yeah. If the Rangers didn't have the lead they have, I would be concerned as a Rangers fan just because of the way the Mariners play within the They play very well within the division. They, mm-hmm. uh, let's just say, let's say right, right now, they play well within the American League West. They have all year. Mm-hmm. It's outside the West where they've had their issues. Mm-hmm. Well, Bo. That's uh, that's gonna do it for us today. It's always a pleasure to have you on the air. We'll be back next week, same time, same channel. I do want to thank DJ Carrasco for stopping by. Fantastic guy. Look forward to having him back on the program again. I also want to thank Dan Schlossberg from Braves Banner stopping by, talking a little bit about those Braves. So, until next week. For Bo Reed and his his, uh, his his gang over there at Let's Talk Rangers dot com, <laughs> I am the Insider Steve. Wishing you a very good afternoon. Stay well, you know, stay cool out there, uh, and have a good have a good afternoon and evening, Canada. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather. <laughs>